Okay, so we're going to start looking at a new class of problems today. They're called constraint satisfaction problems. So what are we looking at so far? It was search. And what was search for? Search was to solve problems where you somehow make a model of the world with a single agent in that world. When actions are taken, you assume they're deterministically successful, so you know the outcome of the actions. And you have a full observation of what it is that the world is like at the next time. And there's some discrete state space of which you're searching. And then the task is to find the sequence of actions that gets you to some goal state. Right? So what was important in all the problems we've looked at so far is the path to the goal. Let's say you want Pac-Man to eat all the dots. It's very easy to know what good goal states are. It's where all the dots are gone, any position of Pac-Man. But how to find a good sequence of actions that eats all the dots, ideally, optimally, that's the challenging part. In a cartoon, the way you can look at this is you're uh, somebody breaking into some fancy place, trying to steal some jewelry. Um, the goal state is the one where the jewelry is in your pocket outside of the building. But the really hard part is to figure out exactly how you got to move to avoid being caught while you're doing this. Right? So it's all about finding that very special sequence of actions that allows you to get in and out without being caught. What we're going to look at in this lecture and next lecture is a different type of search problems. There are still search problems, but the challenge lies somewhere else. And the challenge here is in identifying goal states. So the problems we're going to look at is going to be hard to come up with potential goal states. You can think of it as a detective going around trying to recover that diamond, and once they found a diamond, it's all good, but finding a diamond is really hard. So, standard search problems, the way we formulated them was we had this black box that was saying there's some start state, there is something that tells us what the successors are, there's a goal test, and the successor function could be anything. No matter what, as long as you return a set of states, it was an okay successor function. All way to characterize this is to say, well, the goal state is just something you look at at the very end. When you reach the goal, you'll realize it and somebody gives you a stamp of approval. This is a fully colored map. You did your job. Everything's in a different color. Every neighboring state is in a different color. Constraint satisfaction problems are a special type of search problems. We're going to look at the inside of what's happening. And there are some constraints that we impose on the problem such that they can be a CSP. The state now has to be defined by a subset of the variables being assigned some values. So our running example would be map coloring. So you could imagine that the variables are each of the states, and then an assignment would be a color. And sorry, the variables are each of the, let's call them territories, to not confuse terminology. The variables are each of the territories in the map. And then the domains are the colors you could give to the territories. And your actions are coloring one more territory. And so as you take actions, you're assigning values to variables. And as you progress, at some point you have a fully colored map. If that fully colored map satisfies the goal, the goal condition, which is every neighboring territory has a different color, you're happy. If not, then this is not a good end state that you need to keep searching. Now the goal test in the type of problem we'll look at will not just be one big white box, white box test, it will be a set of constraints. In the example we're looking at here, there's a constraint for every neighboring pair of territories that they can't have the same color. And so the way to look at this is that there's a whole set, a whole book of things you have to consider, not just one goal test, but a whole set of things. This is the first example of something called a formal representation language. And what that means is that we're going to look at a class of problems. And if you capture a real world problem in this particular language, where you say there are variables, there are domains for the variables, and there are constraints that constrain the values each of the variables can take on relative to each other, then you have a CSP. Once you have it in that format, then the solution methods we'll look at will be able to solve it for you. So. In principle, and we'll look at this, you could solve this with 
the search algorithms we already saw in the previous two lectures. But those search algorithms don't exploit the structure that your goal test now consists of these many tests and are in practice very slow. So what we'll look at is more specialized algorithms that can solve these types of search problems faster than the ones, the algorithms we've already seen. Okay, so here's map coloring. Formally, to put it in the language that we're interested in here is set of variables. What are the variables? Each of the territories. And this will be our running example for the lecture, so look at this carefully. This is a map of Australia where we're asked to color each of the territories. And the domains are, we are allowed to color in red, green, and blue. So the domain of each of the variables is red, green, and blue. It doesn't have to be the case that each variable has the same domain. You could have, one variable could have the domain red, green, blue. Another variable could have the domain yellow, black, purple. That's fine too. But in this particular problem, they all have the same domain. The constraints are that adjacent territories cannot have the same color. How do we encode that? That's just text. So we need to put this in a more formal specification. One way to give this specification is called implicit constraint specifications. And what you do there is you essentially say there is a function that I can evaluate and the return value will be true or false. If it's true, then it's good. If it's false, then it's not good. So here's a function you can evaluate. The function is evaluating whether WA is different from NT. WA and NT are two variables. They'll take on a value, for example, red and green. And if this is satisfied, then that's good. Your constraint is satisfied. If this is false, then you have a problem. You can also be more explicit, and a lot of the off-the-shelf solvers will use more explicit constraints. And what you do in an explicit constraint formulation is you look at a pair of variables, and you do that for each pair of variables, potentially larger sets. And for that pair of variables, you will declare a set of pairs of values that are possible. So WA and NT each can be red, green, or blue. They're constrained to not have the same color. So if you look at the pairs of values they can take on together, red and green is allowed, red and blue is allowed, then green and red will be allowed, blue and red is allowed, green and blue is allowed, blue and green is allowed. So you'll have six entries there in this set that are the allowed pairs of values for these, this pair of variables to take on. Okay, the solution to the problem is an assignment that satisfies all the constraints. So the coloring shown on the slide is one example solution. It can be more than one solution, but that's one of the solutions. So this is one assignment that is a solution. What's critical to see here is that it doesn't matter in which order you go in and color the map. What matters is, is that you find a coloring of the map that satisfies all the constraints. So it's not so much the sequence of actions that's going to matter, but it's somehow finding the set of color assignments that satisfies all the constraints. Question, yes. Okay, so this is just a terminology definition. There is nothing mathematical going on here. It's just terminology, and when we say implicit, it means you define a function. So this is a, a Boolean expression that defines a function and it's saying WA not equal to NT. That Boolean expression has to evaluate to true for the constraint to be satisfied, this particular constraint. Whereas the second thing is explicitly giving you a set of values that the variables as a pair can take on, and that's what makes it explicit. So in principle, this is you can think of this as a function too. But a special case of a function where you have the set explicitly specified, and that's what, why we call it explicit. Yes? Okay, so you could say technically there's only one constraint, right? You could say the constraint is all neighboring regions should have a different color. That's way of stating it as one constraint. It's a constraint that involves all of the variables at once. And that's, a, that's an okay, technically an okay way to phrase the problem. It would be one big constraint involving all the variables. What we're going to look at today is if there's more structure to the problem, which there is in this case, in that 
you can, rather than looking at it as one big constraint, look at it as a set of smaller constraints that involve only pairs of variables. Then you can take advantage of this to come up with faster algorithms to solve the problem. So thinking of it as one constraint is not wrong per se in terms of formulation, but it will be a very inefficient formulation for later solving it. Okay, let's look at another example. This is the N-Queens problem. So you have a small uh, chessboard, and you have queens on the chessboard, and you're supposed to place, in this case, four queens on the board, such that they don't attack each other. What does that mean? That means that they cannot be on the same diagonal, they cannot be on the same vertical, they cannot be on the same horizontal. Okay? So that's your problem. The first formulation is to say, well, what are our variables? Our variables here are, for every square on the chessboard, we can decide to place a queen or not, right? So the variables are x, i, j, 16 total, and each of them can take on the value 0 or 1, depending on whether there is a queen or no queen. 1 means there's a queen. Okay, then the constraints, they would have to encode that queens don't attack each other, right? So one way to write this down is to kind of write it down ex explicitly the set of values that are allowed. So we have here, what is this saying? It's saying the first index is the row. So we say for each row i, if we vary the column, so we vary j and k, then we need it to be the case that in that row, we look at two variables in the same row, the pair of variables can only take on the value 0, 0, 0, 1, or 1, 0. Not 1, 1, because that would mean you have two queens in the same row. Same thing for columns over here, and the same thing for upward running diagonals and downward running diagonals here. Okay, now none of the queens will attack each other. Are we done? Somebody says we're not done. Why are we not done? Say it again. There's a constraint that we need to place four queens. So far, all we've said is queens cannot attack each other. That's very well phrased. But nothing is saying you have to put four queens on the board. So I have to add one more constraint. And the last one is that the sum over all variables needs to be n, where n is the number of queens you require to place. You can formulate this in a different way, which you can think of as more efficient. I'll have less variables. This is to say, I know there's never going to be more than one queen in a given row. So I can just think of the variables as for every row there's a variable, and that variable will encode in which column I'm going to place the queen in that row. So Q1 through Q4 are the four variables. Q1 corresponds to, has a domain corresponding to four columns, and so there's four possible values. And now the constraints implicitly become a function that you could code up. If I place a queen in row i in a particular position, row j in a particular position, are they threatening each other? If so, that's bad. If not, that's good. Or you could start writing out the entire set of joint possibilities between pairs of variables. One thing we'll start looking at a lot in throughout this entire semester is whenever we look at problems like this, often we try to take one higher level of abstraction where we say, can we somehow uncover some structure in the problem? And often that will be in the form of graphs. So one thing you can do with constraint satisfaction problems is to say, we have variables, we have constraints. If these constraints always are between two variables, then we can put the variables as the nodes of the graph, the constraints as the edges in the graph. And what we get then is something called a constraint graph. And what this encodes is the interaction between variables in your problem. And often the structure of this graph will tell you something about the difficulty of the problem you're solving. You can imagine if there's no interaction at all, it's a very easy problem, right? There's a lot of interaction, they have a lot of constraints to deal with it, it'll, com it'll become harder. If you look at this graph here, the Australia map coloring problem, you see that Tasmania, the island hanging off to the southeast, is not connected to any other variable. This means there are no constraints that, are that Tasmania is participating in, which means that effectively we have two separate problems. We have one of coloring mainland Australia, and then one of coloring the island. 
whenever you have a constraint satisfaction problem and it breaks down in more than one graph, that means you effectively have separate problems. And we know from previous lectures that typically search is exponentially expensive in how deep you need to search. And here, search is over variable assignments. So the more variables, the more expensive it will be. And so if we can break things down into separate problems, that will reduce the running time of our algorithms by a lot. So this is the kind of structure we'll be looking for in the future. They don't have to fall apart into pieces. There are other structures that will be interesting too. Okay, what are we looking at here? This is the five queens problem. Drawn by hand, and then drawn with a nice computer program on the left. This is a constrained graph for the five queens problem. What are we looking at? There is, for each of the, this is the formulation with one queen per row. So A would be the first row, B is the second row, and so forth. Group is over so we can see that. There we are. A is the first row. That queen can pick on five values, one through five. B is the second row. C is the third row. D is the fourth row. And E corresponds to the last row. The domains are shown in each of the bubbles. And then whenever there's a constraint connecting those variables, there's an edge. In this case, there are constraints between all of them, right? All of them should not be threatening each other. So we have an edge between each pair of variables here. Now what's also shown is that on these edges, there are these boxes. And this is just showing that there is some constraint sitting on this edge. And it's made more explicit. Rather than just drawing an edge, it's putting a box to say there is a constraint. We'll later see why that could be useful. So that's the Queen's problem as a constraint graph. Here's another example. Crypt arithmetic. These are puzzles. What's the idea here? You have a set of variables, which are the letters appearing in the puzzle over here. So the variables are these letters. Also some axes, which we'll get to later. What you're supposed to do is you're supposed to find values for each of these letters such that the addition works out properly. So it will be T will be some digit, W will be some digit, O will be some digit, and so forth, and somehow 2 plus 2 has to be 4 once you substitute in the digits. The x1, x2, x3 correspond to the carry. So if we have to encode this, it's true that O plus O should give R, but potentially there's a carry, and so there would be a carry bit over here, or another one over here, and there could be another one over here. So those are our variables in this problem. The domains are digits 0 through 9. Then the constraints are that each of these additions has to work out. So what, do that, what does that look like? Well, the first constraint is everything has to be different. And then the harder constraints are these ones here. O plus O has to be R plus 10 times X1, and so forth. When you get in a graph, this is what you get. Now what we're doing here is, rather than just drawing edges between variables that are in the same constraint, we have circular nodes for variables, square nodes for constraints, and if more than two variables participate in a constraint, it's no problem here. We just connect them all up to the box. So for example, here, we have a constraint with three variables, O, R, and X1. That one's appearing here. And that's explicitly encoded in this graph, because now we can see that there's this constraint that has three variables participating in it. So that's why often we like the boxes. If there's just two variables per constraint, it doesn't do a whole lot. It's just sitting, boxes sitting on an edge. But once there's more than two values per constraint, you need them to be able to encode the structure of the problem. Okay, here's another one. Another puzzle. Um, Sudoku. What's the problem here? You're given this grid, and you're supposed to throw numbers into every empty square. Now, within, because what are the constraints? The constraints are that within every one of those three by three regions, that's kind of Frame, has a frame around it, you have to have nine different digits. Then on every row, you need to have nine different digits. Every column, you need to have nine different digits. So you have a nine-way, all for each column, 
for each row and then for each region. If you hook that all up, you get a big constraint graph and that will encode the structure of the problem. With the algorithms we'll look at today and next lecture, if you ever need to solve a Sudoku puzzle again, you should have to just code them up and have your algorithm solve them really quickly. Often there's a choice. One choice here is that instead of having the nine way all diff, you can in principle also have pairwise constraints. That's, a, that's up to you and will depend a little bit on exactly what solution algorithm you use, what will be faster to solve for. Because you could say every pair of entries on a given row has to have a different number, or you could say all nine have to be all different. It's encoding the same information just in a slightly different way. So you have some freedom here in how you formulate the problem. Here's one from early AI days computer vision. Um, what was the problem here? Let's say you look at an image, and you realize that a lot of the information in an image is encoded in the edges in the image. So you write some filtering algorithm that essentially does a high pass filter, finds the high frequencies in your image, and what you get out is something that looks like this. And now you're trying to interpret the geometry of what you're looking at. You wonder, well, this is just a 2D image. What is the real geometry here? Is, for example, this region here, is that something that's sticking out to me in the image, or is it pointing away from me, right? And so the way people formulated this as a constraint satisfaction problem is they would look at these line drawings and would look at every intersection, and here's an example intersection, and every intersection would correspond to a variable. And for an intersection like this, there are two possible values that an intersection variable could take on. One value is it's, if you look at this, you might see it popping back and forth. One value is that this is pointing at you, and the other value is that this is a corner of a room that you're looking at that's pointing away from you. And so the two possible interpretations of this, this um, junction are the two values the variable can take on. Then how does the constraint satisfaction problem work? The constraints are relative to neighboring junctions. So whenever you have a junction, let's say here, there will be a constraint between this junction and this junction and also, so there's one here, there'll be one here, there'll be another one here, and so forth. So whenever you have neighboring junctions by following the edges, you have constraints. And the constraint relates to whether you have a, essentially a convex or a concave edge that you're faced with. And you have to be consistent in both junctions. And by requiring things to be consistent, you can narrow down the possibilities and you can get a consistent image of the entire scene. Sometimes there's still two consistent images, but in principle, you can enumerate the images, the interpretations that are reasonable for the image you're looking at. So this is a constraint satisfaction problem that's not a puzzle. It's a computer vision problem, and you can formulate it this way to interpret the geometry of a scene. In general, there's a lot of varieties of constraint satisfaction problems. The easiest ones to illustrate the problems with are often puzzles, but in the real world, there's a lot of them out there, and there's a lot of variety in the properties they have. Some have finite domains, some of them have infinite domains. So for us, we'll look at finite domain constraint satisfaction problems, domain size D. And if you have n variables, then there is D to the n complete assignments. So that's the space you're really searching over all possible assignments, and then you want to know which ones of those are satisfying all the constraints. There are many infinite domain ones. The techniques for that are somewhat similar, but there are also some there's also some trickiness there. You need to do some extensions to what we look at. And there you can also solve constraint satisfaction problems for things like scheduling, where start and end times might be anywhere between zero and infinity and so forth. It might also be that your variables are continuous versus discrete. So if you have continuous variables, often the solution methods used are something called linear programs or convex optimization algorithms or some more general nonlinear optimization approach. It's not what we're going to look at in this class, but we'll get some hint at um, in next lecture at how these problems might be solved. But really what we'll be looking at is this type of CSPs over here. The constraints can vary. We've looked at the difference between um, implicit, explicit formulations. There are other differences. A constraint could be just about one variable. That's called a unary constraint. That means only variable participating 
is that one variable, for example, South Australia is not allowed to be colored in green. That could be a constraint. For binary constraints, not the same color, for example. And then there could be more than two variables, so higher order constraints, in which case we need the boxes to represent the constraints in the constraint graph. This will be look at for now. Later, when we see base nets, we'll see that you can in some sense think of them as an extension of constraint satisfaction problems, where you can have soft assignments, where you have preferences rather than constraints. You might prefer a certain region to be colored green, but it doesn't have to be green. For now, we can't handle that. For now, the constraints are all hard, has to be something, or there's no requirement on it at all. But in the future, we'll be able to get to handle those too. There are some examples of real world CSPs. Very typical ones are assignment problems. For example, which professor is supposed to teach which class? What's the room to put a class in? Um, for students, how do you make up your schedule? Right? You, you have a set of variables, which is every time block in the week. How do you fill that in with activities, right? Um, hardware configuration. Routing problems on chips are often solved with CSP solvers. Transportation scheduling. How, let's say, should the UC, USP, UPS truck be loaded? What should go in? Should it, how should it do it so that it delivers everything to every proper place? And so forth. Factory scheduling. How do you lay out factories so that they're most efficient? Um, circuit layout, fault diagnosis. There are a lot of real world problems out there that are much larger than the ones we can illustrate on the slides. Often, though, you also have to deal with real variables and will require an extension beyond what we cover here. Okay, so how do we solve these problems? We know what they're like. We haven't seen yet how to solve them. As a straw man, we'll start with what we already know how to do. We know how to solve search problems, so let's put a CSP in the standard search formulation and see what happens. So what does that mean to put in a standard search formulation? We say there's an initial state, Initial state is the empty assignment. The successive function is you can pick any variable that's not assigned yet and assign a value to it, any of the values in the domain. So there's many successors. For every variable, you can pick an assignment, and so you get a very big dimension factor here. The goal test will be then to check if all constraints are satisfied once and if all variables have been uh, assigned a value. So... This would work. You can implement this and for really small problems, this will work, give you a solution. So let's look at how this would operate. BFS, one of our algorithms from last time. What would it do for this problem here? Let's say, well, you start with the empty set of variables assigned. What are the successors? Well, successors, there's many of them. You can have a successor where you have NT equals blue. Successor NT equals red. Successor NT equals green. We have a successor Q equals red, and so forth. There's a lot of successors here. Number of variables times the number of values in each domain. After you've expanded now, you look at your fringe, which is over here. Fred for search picks the Shallowest node available, they're all equally shallow, so you break ties in some arbitrary way. So we pick this one first. We expand this one. Many, many options here. Every variable that hasn't been assigned yet can be assigned many values. Yes. So one, the question here is about can we do this more efficiently? Absolutely. For now, we're just looking at what would that first search do, and then we'll build up to much more efficient algorithms. And breadth search will keep working through this entire process. And all the way at the bottom here somewhere, it will finally have a full assignment where maybe if it's lucky, it will satisfy all the constraints and it will have found a solution. But by the time this happens, it will actually have built up a huge search tree before it even has any chance of succeeding because all the, good, all the solutions are at the bottom of this tree. So it's a, not a great strategy to kind of Build the entire tree top down, because all the solutions are at the bottom. So BFS found not the winning strategy. Last time we were kind of making fun of uh, DFS, because it was this kind of not so great algorithm for the problems we were looking at then. But here it might be a better fit, actually. We know all the solutions are at the bottom when all the variables have been assigned, 
That's the only way you can have a solution. DFS will run right to the bottom of the search tree. So if we run DFS, we get something that goes right to the bottom. It doesn't know where at the bottom the solutions are, so it'll go all the way down. And then maybe it'll have a solution, maybe not. And it'll keep searching until it happens to run into a solution at the bottom. So typically this will be much more efficient, because you don't build up the entire tree before you even have a chance of having success. What problems does this have? Let's look at a demo, and then we'll round up what the problems are with uh, depth first search. So we'll look at depth first search. Here it is, our demo. Simple graph. Naive search is our other word for depth first search here. What are we looking at? We're looking at a coloring problem. So this is showing the constrained graph. Neighboring nodes cannot have the same color. Um, we'll search by assigning values, laying depth for a search. So we start at the bottom left, um, big blue, big blue for the next one. What does depth for a search do next? Well, it goes to the next node, just one over here. Goes, signs blue, keeps working its way down the tree. Never satisfies the goal test type, so never happy. Um, it's all the way down. We made it all the way down, which is good, but it's not a success. Um, what does it do? You know it has this fringe on the path down. So it'll go one up in the tree and start going down again. So next step, the assignment we'll be looking at is this one here. We'll look at this successor. We'll keep going. Now it's going to little further up, back up in the search tree. Keeps working. Let's hit play. Let's make it faster, 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 faster. Faster and faster, and it's still working. This is going really fast, and it's just it's going even faster. Two thousand times. Okay, let's pause this for a second. These first two assignments here are really problematic. Blue and blue, right? Underneath, there in the tree, there's nothing that's going to succeed. But DFS doesn't check for that. It just checks whether the goal state, it's a goal state or not. It's not, so it keeps going. That's one big problem. So let's look at the problems we have. So one big problem is that even though we already know that it's going to fail and it's useless to look further in that part of the tree, it's still searching there. So because why do we know it's going to fail? Because we have a set of constraints and we know that one of these constraints is violated. And once one is violated, it will never be satisfied later, right? So that's something we can do. The other thing that was very naive about what we drew here is that in the top layer, we considered NT blue, NT red, NT green, but then also Q red, Q blue, Q green, and so forth. So you can imagine there's really no need to consider all variables in the top layer, and again, all remaining variables in the next layer, and so forth, because it doesn't matter in which order you assign the variables. You could ahead of time fix the ordering of the variables, and then every layer would only have one variable, rather than all variables that are still left over. So those are two very naive things that we're going to fix. So one variable at a time in each layer, and Check constraints as you go. So once you assign a variable, you check the constraints are satisfied. If any constraint is violated, you start backtracking already, and you discard the subtree below it. It's called incremental goal testing. If you incorporate those two fairly straightforward improvements, it's called backtracking search. So backtracking search is depth first search with these two fixes. Let's take a look at how well this works in the coloring problem. So I'll switch from our naive search to backtracking search. We we'll start here, blue. Now it won't have blue, blue, because it knows that's not going to expand to anything useful. So we have red here, blue, keep going. Here we have to backtrack, it's green. There's nothing available for that next node, so it has to undo that. So what we see happening is that it still has to backtrack frequently because it doesn't really know what's going to come in the future. But at least it's not continuing whenever it's already obviously failed, and it finds a solution reasonably quickly. 
For the n queens problems, if you use this approach, you can solve it up to n equal 25 fairly quickly. We want to do better. So, in the terms of the search tree that you're looking at for the coloring example, you only have one region that you're coloring in a given layer, and then you'd only color in the next layer things that are consistent with what you already had. All right. What does this look like in terms of algorithm if you were to program this? Um, it's just that first search, we know how these searches work. Um, in addition to that, you have some kind of ordering of variables that you decide on. So you have a check in the beginning of the function. If the assignment is complete, then you return the assignment. You know if there was something wrong with it, you already have stopped. So if you reach a complete assignment, you know it's good, you declare success. Otherwise, pick an unassigned variable. I haven't told you yet how to pick the unassigned variable, but let's say if somebody tells you which one to pick, you then, for each value in the domain of that unassigned variable, you fill in that value, you check whether the constraints are still satisfied. If the value is consistent with the assignment so far, then you add it onto your search tree, you keep going down, you do a recursive backtracking call. Um, when you come back from that, it'll tell you whether the result was a failure or a success. Accordingly, um, if it says failure, you jump back up in the tree. If it's a success so far, then you return success. Um, if it's a failure, the way you go back up in the tree is by removing this last assignment, fixing it up by taking the next assignment and trying again. If you reach this point over here, it means that you never return success, and that means you failed. Okay, so that's backtracking search. That first search with quick as you go along, checking whether things are still consistent. What are our choice points? The choice points are in terms of which variable to pick next, and when you have a variable, which value to assign to that variable next. So just like in graph search, we got to choose which variable to pick from the fringe, and the strategy we used for that determined how fast the graph search would be. We also get a strategy that we can decide upon to make things faster or slower depending on our choice. Okay, so what are the ways we can improve this? The first idea is something called filtering. And the idea here is that even though backtracking search at every stage checks whether the constraints are still satisfied, sometimes even though the constraints are still satisfied, you can already see that this is not going to succeed. By looking carefully at the structure of the problem, and say, oh, this is guaranteed to fail even though it hasn't failed yet. Filtering is going to give us tools to do that and detect the failure earlier. Another thing we can do is choose the ordering of variables and value. And the last thing we can do is we can start looking at the graph, the constraint graph, looking at the structure of that graph and exploiting it to find more efficient algorithms that are a whole different category of algorithms that are very, very different from what we're looking at here. Let's take a break here, and after the break, let's look at these improvements. Okay, let's then look at our choice points and how we can speed things up here. So, filtering. I said the big fish idea behind filtering is that while you're running your search, you're going to try to detect early on whether that part of the search tree still has a chance of succeeding or not. So, to be able to do that, we're going to keep track of the, what we call the filtered domains of each variable. So when we start to search, every variable has its complete domain associated with it. And so in this case, all possible colors are associated with each of the variables, which is shown here. Then, after we do an assignment, we make the Western, Western Australia region red. What happens is we assign this one red, which is shown this way full red bar, and for its neighbors, we know that they cannot be red anymore because Western Australia is already assigned red. So the neighbors are MT and SA, and the red is gone here, and the red is gone here. So we pruned out of the domains of the two neighbors such that it represents our knowledge about what is still possible for those domains. Okay, then we color the next one. We color green for the top right, 
Again, we look at the neighbors, that one there, and we prune green out of here, out of here, and out of here. So anytime we assign a variable some value, this is on our way down in the search tree, we look at all its neighbors and get rid of the values that are not possible anymore now. Keep working through this, find the blue there, and what happens now? After we go through this process again, and we prune all its neighbors the blue values, we see that one of its neighbors here ends up with an empty domain. What that means is that we're working our way down the search tree. At this point, we already know that there's never going to be a solution anywhere further down there. Because no matter how we're going to assign the variables next, we're not going to be able to succeed because one of the variables has no values left to assign. But even though we never got to SA in the search tree, we never got to NSW, we never got to NT, we know that we're not going to succeed and we can start backtracking from there. Yes? Okay, what we're looking at here is, let's say you start with the empty assignment, right? Your search is a depth first search. Let's say the first thing you did was assign WA equals red. And you considered two other possibilities there for WA, right? But then you can, after you made this assignment here, you do this update over here, where you prune the domains of all the other variables. And that pruning is only valid in this subtree below over here. So it's specific to where you are in the tree, the pruning. All right. Then here you pick a next variable. The next variable we picked was M Q. So we pick Q. And we pick green. So we pick Q equal green. Um, there's two other choices for Q. After we pick Q equals green, we will then prune the domains of all its neighbors to get rid of the green value. And we will keep going down and that's, by the time we're down here, we have um, V equals blue. And once we assign V equals blue, so we're at depth four, we realize A domain is empty, and we realize we have to go back up. Yes? We'll get to that, yes. That's a great observation. So what we're looking at for now is not the most advanced way of doing this, but it's the advantage of it is a very quick way of doing things. So it might actually be the preferred way of doing this because it's very quick, even though you can do more complicated inferences. So this is called forward checking. Whenever you instantiate a variable, you prune the domains of the other variables participating in constraints with that variable. Okay, let's look at a demo again, how this works. So we'll run forward checking on the simple graph, backtracking with forward checking. So we start at the bottom left. Once we assign a value at the bottom left, its neighbors will get that value pruned. All right, so we assign blue, and its three neighbors now don't have blue anymore. Then next one next to it, we assign red, and now the neighbors don't have red anymore. Next one, we assign green or blue. We can choose, right? Um, it took blue. And then the neighbors got rid of their blue values. Keep working down in our depth first search. At this point, we actually don't have any options anymore for one of the variables, so we know we're going to fail. And so we backtrack. And backtracking means that you kind of go back up in the tree and come back down another branch. So the green you get rid of um, is the only thing available, so there's not much that you could do. You have to go even further back. We have green and red there, so you can switch it around from red to green. But now, again, there's an empty domain, so you have to backtrack. Backtrack all the way there, as you keep going. Whenever you have an empty domain, you backtrack. You see how relatively quickly you find a solution. Remember the original depth first search, the very naive search, took forever, and we still didn't get there? Here, in just a couple of backtracking operations, we're able to get to a solution. Steven.
You give me a little head, but there's an option here called MRV. And once you enable that option, it will pick the right variable. We haven't enabled it yet, but we'll get to that. Okay, so that was backtracking search with forward checking, which allows us to realize earlier that we're going to fail and so not go down, as far down the tree um, as we otherwise would. Now, there's something more complicated you can do, which is called constraint propagation, and it's getting to the question there. Let's look at this situation over here. We're running the search. The domains have been pruned to some extent. What we see here is NT only has blue left, and SA only has blue left. But they're neighbors. So we know that it's impossible to succeed here. Because at some point, we're going to have to assign a value to each of those. And the both are going to end up being blue. It's going to result in a constraint violation. And we're going to have to backtrack. So from looking at this problem, we already know it's going to fail. But forward checking doesn't know this. Forward checking only backtracks whenever a domain becomes empty. There's no empty domains here, so forward checking is not aware of this at all. But we see it, and we're going to see another formulation that can find this. So how do we find this? How can we make this be detected? We'll do something called enforcing our consistency. And it'll be a repeated process. At the core, we'll enforce consistency of one arc. So what does it mean to enforce consistency of one arc? You have two variables, x and y. There's an arc from x to y. And we say that arc is consistent if and only if for every x in the tail, there is some y in the head which could be assigned without violating a constraint. So let's take a closer look at what that means. Here is an arc from NT to WA. NT is the tail. The tail is where we're going to try to delete things from. Right? So we're looking at the constraints between W and NT. We look at this current domain here, and we look through it. We say, how about red? Is that still possible? No, that's not possible anymore because WA is red and they're neighbors, so you can't both be red. So we need to get rid of the red there. No more red. All right. Green is okay and blue is okay. Let's look at another arc. Again, the important is that we always look at the tail of the arc and we cycle through its values. Red, Q, and WA, they're not neighbors. So not a problem. Green and red, green is okay, blue is okay. So no problem here. Next arc, and so forth. The way you can remember where to delete from is with this cartoon here. What's the idea? This is just a mnemonic. It's not a mathematical thing, but it's, it helps you remember how this works. Imagine the constraint satisfaction police pulls you over. Where are they going to check and pull things out of? The back of your car, the trunk. Okay? You think of these arcs as a constraint satisfaction police, and you remember this picture to know that the back of the car is where you delete things from. All right. Always delete from the tail. What is forward checking? Forward checking is enforcing our consistency for a very specific set of arcs. It's the arcs that go into the variable that you just assigned. That's what forward checking is. You pick that particular set of arcs from every other variable into the variable you just assigned and enforce our consistency. But we can, there's more arcs we could consider, right? And so the idea in enforcing full arc consistency is that you consider all arcs and enforce consistency of all of them. So here's an example situation. Um, we look at this arc first. P and NSW, they're neighbors. Um, is red still possible for V? Yes, because NSW could still be blue, so that's fine. Is green still possible? Yes, because that's compiled with red and blue. Is um, blue still possible? Yes, blue is still possible because that's compatible with um, still white, I think. Blue is still possible because there's a compatible assignment to NSW. So we cannot delete anything from the tail. Keep that in mind. We couldn't delete anything from V based on this arc. We move on. Here's another arc. SA. Can we delete anything from the tail? Well, there's only one value in there. It's blue. It's compatible with the other one being red. So 
can't delete anything. Let's look the other, at the other direction. Here, NSW pointing to SA. How about red? Is that still okay? Yes, it's compatible with blue. Then how about blue? No, that's not compatible with the other one because the other one can only be blue. So again, we get rid of the blue over here. Now something interesting happens. Let's look again at the arc we considered in the very beginning. At the very beginning, we were not able to delete anything from the tail. We're going back to it now because in the head there has been a deletion. Things have changed. So now check whether red can still be in the domain of V. The answer is no. Because the only option for NSW is red, and red and red is not compatible. So the second time around, because the domain of NSW has been pruned, we can also prune from V. So this brings up something really critical in enforcing full R consistency, which is it's not enough to look at every arc once. Whenever you delete something from a domain of a variable, you have to reconsider all the arcs that point into that variable because maybe now you can delete from the tail of these arcs pointing in. Okay, so that's the main idea. You, put, you look at all arcs. If you delete something from the tail, then you reconsider all arcs that point into that tail. What does it look like as an algorithm? Here's its, here it is spelled out. It's just following what we just executed. It's putting all arcs on the queue, cycling through them, and then deleting if it deletes a value from the tail, putting new arcs on the queue accordingly. How long is this going to take? Could this loop forever? Well, let's think about this. How often could you put an arc on the queue? You can put an arc on the queue whenever you deleted something from its head. If the size of the domain is D, then you can at most put an arc D times onto the queue. There's a limitation how often you can come onto the queue, which is D. When you are being checked, well, you need to check all pairs of values in the worst case, so that's D squared. So that's D times D squared. And you have to do this for all uh, arcs, which is N squared. So the running time, what we just described is worst case N squared D cubed. Turns out there's a clever trick you can play to make it run a little faster. You get N squared D squared. No need for you to know what that trick is. Now let's look at a demo for N queens again. Here's our N queens problem. Remember, here's what the problem looks like. We're going to solve it. We're going to run our consistency. So how does this work? We can in this applet, click on any edge, and oh, this edge corresponds to a constraint. This is an arc. This is the arc from A to B. We can click on it. We have force and force consistency. Nothing was deleted from the domain of A because B could still be any from 1 through 5, so there's no real constraint on A yet. We can do this one here. This is the arc B to A. It's green because the constraint, the arc has been enforced, and the domain is still free for B because there are no um, limitations on the values you can take on. Let's run our consistency all the way, automatically. This will keep running until all the edges are green, which means all arcs are now consistent. What do we see? We see actually none of the domains are getting pruned. They're all still fully 1 through 5. That's just because ahead of time, by just looking at pairs of queens, there's no constraint. If the other one can still break on all values, there's nothing said about the first one. Now, in a backtracking search, after you run our consistent, and first our consistency, you would assign a variable. Let's assign A. So, assigning A, let's see how we do that. We take one. So, this is one branch in our search tree. We assign one. Now we can again run R consistency, right? We put all arcs in the queue and press R consistency. Let's run it. And so anything that's green is satisfied. Anything that's blue is still on the queue. Every now and then you see a red flash. What that means is that something got deleted out of the domain, and as a consequence, some arcs got put back into the queue. Your queue was growing again. Do 
here we are. And then what we're backtracking search do, you have enforced our consistency, you pick another one, maybe we pick B, we assign three, okay, we run our consistency, Everything is green, so all arcs are consistent. All variables have only one value left in their domains. So at this point, all constraints are satisfied. They only have one value left in each domain. That means this assignment satisfies all the constraints, right? And so that means we're done, and we're done very quickly. Okay, so that's enforcing our consistency and how it interacts with backtracking search. Um, Couple of properties. Let's say we enforce our consistency on this problem here. At this point, we're done. All arcs are consistent, but there's still two values left here and two values left here. This is important to keep in mind. Enforcing our consistency doesn't necessarily completely solve your problem. It's just pruning domains and helping you in your search. It could also be that you land in this situation, where your R consistency has two values left in every domain, and everything's consistent, but there's actually no solution left. So, because R consistency still has values left, doesn't mean there's guaranteed to be a solution further down that branch of the tree. It just has pulled the domains up to a certain level, and that's what it's doing for you. No guarantee that there's a solution. In fact, in this case, there's no solution further down that part of the search tree. So you can have one solution left, as you signed the all queens, the five queens problem, then you're done, that's great. Multiple solutions left, as of here, or you can have no solutions left, and you wouldn't know it. Same when you have multiple, so when you have multiple solutions left here, you don't know it. As far as the search is concerned, it doesn't know which situation you're in, you have to go further down the tree before you find out. So you still have to run backtracking search, it just helps your backtracking search. Now, one thing that uh, has been brought up a couple of times is how do you pick which variable to instantiate next? And you have multiple options available. And what we're going to do here is pick the one that is the hardest first. So we go this one here, the most difficult situation first. Why do we pick the variable with the least number of remaining values? Here's the intuition. If there's very few remaining values, let's say one remaining value, you already know what it's supposed to be. So you don't get any branching in your search tree. You just assign that one value without any additional branching. So that's really beneficial. In general, the less value is available, the less branching, and maybe once you instantiated it, and you run forward checking, or you run our consistency, other domains will improve more, and so you end up with a much smaller search tree that you're traversing if you go the ones that are most constrained first. So minimum remaining values is being heuristic to use. This is not a guarantee that it's the best thing to do, but typically this will work better. So here, you will start with one of them, they're all the same. After that, you pick a neighbor. After that, minimum remaining value will be picking the neighbor of both of them. So you do go with blue there, and that way you can much more quickly fill up your coloring problem. So the idea here is that that allows you to fail much faster in your search and have a much slow, much lower branching factor as you work your way down. And which value to pick first? Here we do the opposite thing. So we pick the least constraining value first. What does that mean? We look at the domain, we pick the variable, we have let's say a couple of colors left, red and green left, then for red and green, we check if we were to pick red, how much would that constrain our problem? What does that mean? If I were to pick red, after picking red, let's say run our, enforce our consistency, you'll see what the consequences are on the domains of your other variables. If there are very severe consequences, the domains become very small, that means red is not necessarily the best choice because it's putting a lot of constraints on the other variables. Then you look at green, do the same thing, you run uh, 
Our consistency, you see how many values are left for the other variables after you assign green. And if you have more values left, then that's the better choice. Why is it better to go with one that leaves you more options for the other variables? Well, the idea is the following. There's two possible situations. One situation, your problem doesn't have a solution in that part of the search tree. If it doesn't have a solution, it doesn't matter which value you pick first. If it doesn't have a solution, you're going to have to explore all options to find out that there's no solution. So in that case, it doesn't matter. If in that part of the search tree there is a solution, then you rather find that solution before traversing the entire tree. So you want to be optimistic and say, where I, do I have the best chance of finding a solution and go there first? So that's the intuition here. So let's look at this in action. Here's our problem again. Let's look at a couple of demos. So let's look first at the complex graph, backtracking search, forward checking. Start here, here. We see that the names are getting pruned as we go along. Here is something interesting going on. We have green here and green here. Forward checking doesn't care about that, right? It just checks whether some domain became empty, so we actually keep going in forward checking. At this point, it tends to get stuck there because once it assigns that green, the other one becomes empty, and so it can't pursue, it has to backtrack. So it's spending some time there. Now we've resolved that issue. It's getting through, and things work out pretty well. So that was backtracking with forward checking. Now let's look at our consistency. We're running backtracking search again, but after every assignment, we do our we have first our consistency. After signing blue. We have just the neighbors that are being pruned here. After signing red here, this one only has green left. As a consequence, this one here, through enforcing our consistency, loses its green possibility. Keep going. Thanks to that, we don't get stuck in this kind of green and green cycle here. We actually go through this bottleneck pretty easily. Doesn't mean because you run backtracking search with our consistency at every step that you don't have to backtrack. Right? In fact, here it's going to happen, all the domains are empty, so we have to backtrack a little bit. But now it just goes through. So it does the advantage of our consistency. You look further ahead, but keep in mind you have to do more work after every assignment. Now let's go back to forward checking. And remember, this is what we had for forward checking originally. With this big bottleneck, you get the picture. Let's do forward checking, but order the variables according to the minimum remaining values ordering. So we start with the first one still in the bottom left corner. There's two with two values left, so we break ties somehow. Now there's one with only one value left. That's the least, so we go there. Now there's two left here, that's the least, so that's where we go next in terms of variable to assign. We kind of follow how the constraints propagate through this process as we assign. And so in this particular case, we get through the entire problem without ever having to backtrack using forward checking and the minimum remaining value heuristic. We have another USC that we could use, MRV and least constraining value, but we can't really improve upon what we just saw. You went through it in one pass, reordering the colors in some way is not going to do better than that.
If you do this for the thousand creams problem, you can actually solve it quite quickly with this approach. All right, that's it for today. Next time we'll look at how to exploit structure and how to do local searches.